Welcome back to In Our Own Defense Podcast. Um, you know, this is a great episode uh, where we're discussing racial discrimination in the military uh, and UCMJ. We have these powerful guests here with us today. Uh, Quintilis Lawrence, uh, former commissioner in Baton Rouge, current Judge Advocate General of the United States Armed Reserve, and running for judge uh, in, in Baton Rouge. And we have the Chestangs, two commanders, United States Navy there, uh, stationed in Washington, D.C., but they're beautiful, beautiful babies. Uh, we're coming back to the show. Uh, Dr. Tarver, I defer to you, please. Yes, sir. So uh, everybody is not able to see because when whoever's speaking, the camera is on them, so you can't see what everybody else is doing. Uh, but uh, we have had a pop-in from Commissioner Lawrence's, uh, I think that was maybe a son <laughs> that popped in. Um, to, to, to face bomb and we have had uh, one of the, the commander's sons hanging tight with us this evening for the podcast. He is dying to try to get on this podcast and they won't let him be great. Uh, but it brings me to the, the perspective of there are so many things that can happen when a person is in the military, right? You have families, you get married, you, you're growing and you're developing. A lot of you enter when you were fairly young and so developmentally you're going through a lot of changes and you come into your adulthood often in the military and we know that the divorce rates can be very high for uh, military spouses we know that people experience suicidal thoughts we have people that complete suicide during their service in the military alcoholism other substance abuse depression anxiety post-traumatic stress disorder so i would like for you all to just kind of share your experiences around the distress that can come from balancing all of the things that you all have been discussing, how it's affected you if you want to share personally, but also what you've seen during your service in the military in terms of why so many people are struggling with mental health concerns. I guess I'll take the, the lead on this one. Uh, Lori has Lauren over there trying to keep him calm. Um, but uh, my experience, um, sailors uh, we struggle uh, very, you know, very hard with um, marriages and relationships and things like that uh, because you know there's this thing called the ship schedule, and so the ship schedule tells you, you know, you're gonna do these things, you know, for training. And then you're going to go and deploy for six months, seven months or so. So that's what you, you believe in your mind. But in between all of that, in, inside those trainings, there are other times that you go out to sea, you know, and you're out there for weeks training. You're not at home. And so your spouse, your significant other, is at home depending on you to help them out. And so you're catching all kinds of stressors from not being able to communicate with that, that spouse, with that significant other, with that child, you know, which we just learned of. We're thankful to be in a position that we're in right now where we don't have to deal with that as much. But those who have to go out and see and deploy, if you have young kids and they say it's time to go, you got you to gotta leave them behind. And then you're gone for, for weeks, you come back. There's a lot of changes that happen between who's ever taking care of the kid and the kid, you know, and then yourself. And you want to decompress because you're getting no sleep out there. You're not eating right. And you want to get rest, but it's time to work when you get home. And then you turn around and you have to, you have to go again. And you, you work up until you deploy and you're gone for months. And so by the time you come back, your kid doesn't know you. Your spouse or significant other is very upset with you. And there's your divorce paper. A lot of times the kids walk, come back home, the sailors come back home into a divorce, you know, and, and they didn't even see it coming. They see it on email. You pull into a port after three, four months at sea, you catch a phone call. That's all you get. You know, now you can do FaceTime, but back in the day, it wasn't, it wasn't that. You just had phone calls when you got off the ship. You know, now you can connect via Wi-Fi and do a FaceTime and see uh, what you're dealing with back home but you know that's all you got and so uh that really really challenges the mind you know let alone if you're a young enlisted sailor and your finances are what they are and you have a spouse who's depending on you 
to deliver, but it's really not enough. And so they're, they're going hungry. They need something. They can't get it. They have no support. You can't provide it. It's tough, you know, and the same exists for officers just at a different level. And uh, I don't know how you get over that. It's just something that we all go through and you see many, 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 many divorces, many, many people going through PTSD, many, many people try drugs to get over it, many, many, many domestic abuse situations, you know, all of those things. And so um, that's, a, that's something I don't know that will, will ever change. It's, military says, you're mine, I need you to do this, and they don't care about the rest. And you have to deal with that. So I tell service members, if you can avoid getting married, <laughs> you know, avoid packing on that extra, do that. It's nothing wrong with waiting because the minute you do, the Navy isn't going to care. They, they aren't going to care. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, calling me an extra and a burden. Yeah. Maybe we should have waited. Um, <laughs> so, we need uh, everybody that started out married at the beginning of this podcast to remain married. <laughs> right. I like, just be is out here ruining marriages and telling people to not have kids. Gee, what is going on? Um, so I, I will be the first one to step up in the room. And I will proudly say I have used the mental health services at the military for class. I, I have. Um, and I think I say that because I, I think we do, like I said, we still have a ways to go. And we need to get past the stigma that if you go um, and see someone that to get help that you're weak. Um, and that is not the case. Sometimes, sometimes you just need someone to talk to. Sometimes you would like to choke Randy out. Sometimes <laughs> Randy has come home from deployment and forgotten that he's been gone for the last seven months and I got this, boo, I got this. And you have to figure out how to get back into that balance. And I think especially being a dual military couple um, and for those dual military uh, youngsters who are listening, uh, we understand it is hard and especially you know, when you are a woman on that side of the dual military couple, you know, you're already, you're already type A. You've already got it. And when, when your husband leaves or your spouse leaves, you're still going to have it and you're going to be fine. Um, but you have to remember, you know, to, I don't, I don't want to say reel yourself in in a negative way, but you have to remember that your spouse, when they come back, you know, they, they still need to feel loved. They still need to feel needed. Um, and it is okay to be a type A woman and say, you know what? I'm going to let you take out the garbage today. Thanks for coming back. Or, you know what? It, that couch, you can move it. It's fine. Um, and sometimes it takes, it takes the, the help of a mental health professional to get you there. Um, but I just want people to know, you know, really, there is, there is no shame and going and asking for help. You know, sometimes, you know, your mama can't help you um, and your, your spouse isn't going to be able to help you. You just need someone who is removed from your situation because, you know, your mom is your mother and she loves you and she's going to try and fix things for you and, you know, try and tell you what she's been through. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes you just, you need someone who does not know you and can listen objectively, uh, to give you the best advice. And oh, by the way, it's free for military members. It doesn't cost you anything. So, you know, if you get to that point and you don't have to be suicidal, you don't have to be climbing the walls, you know, you would just be in a place where things have been happening in your life um, and you just need to talk to someone to help you figure it out and that is okay. I just want to thank you for that shout out before Commissioner Lawrence uh, speaks for, for therapy because there's still, even though I'm hearing you all say that the military has come a long way in its recognition of mental health and providing you all access, 
there's still a lot of stigma around seeking services for military people. And there's still that concern, that there's a shadow of doubt that this will be used against me at some point in the future, particularly if I already know that the, <coughs> the deck may be stacked against me in terms of how some people see me with my ethnicity or my gender. But I absolutely appreciate you um, for, for talking about your being in therapy, because I think more people need to hear folks say that and recognize, you know, you do not have to be schizophrenic uh, in order for you to go seek therapy. You may just have, as you two both have, different perspectives about um, what is what, what your uh, needs and concerns were being dual military. So thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Lawrence? Yes. Well, um, I, um, I, was, I was deployed and I had a, a buddy of mine, a frat brother actually, and he um, he was married. I was not married at the time. He was married. He is married and was married at the time. They had two children. One, one of them was, I think, three or four years old. He was a toddler. He was in preschool, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, he got a phone call and he called his wife and talked to his son. And his son told him about his day. And he told him about some program they had. I think it was like, uh, what do your parents do or something like that? And he told the teacher, he doesn't have a dad. And he asked him, he said, why did you say that? He said, because you're not here. Now we are in Kuwait, going back and forth to Iraq. And he heard that his baby had told his teacher he didn't have a dad because his dad wasn't there. Now I had no children at the time. I couldn't quite really understand it. I didn't feel the gravity of what that did to him. Um, but fast forward, when I did have children, and I wasn't in jeopardy of deploying or going anywhere, but just that incident kept replaying in my head. Him being in central sitcom AO, and he talks to his son, and his son says, I don't have a daddy because you're not here. Oh, that was that that affected me, and I can only imagine how it affected him. Not being in a position where he can say, "Look, guys, I gotta go. I gotta go check on my son." Uh, there's no plane that drops you back and forth from Atlanta, Georgia, to uh, Kuwait. Uh, they don't have a, a, a Uber truck plane that runs you back and forth whenever you want to. So he's stuck there until he either gets his. Uh, R and R leave, or he's ready to go and redeploy. That was that was something that I witnessed, and it affected me a little bit. But then it affected me like post, like two, three, four, five years later, when when it wasn't even happening. He's back at home with his kids. He's good to go. And I'm thinking, okay, if I end up going somewhere, am I gonna be in that same position with my little one year old, my two year old, my three year old? Well, the Lord has blessed me that I did not have to deal with that because I have a 14-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter. And while if I had to leave them today, it's, it's understandable. My wife understands that I've signed up for this, but it would still be painful. And like Commander Chastain said, therapy is not, it is, it is not the stigma that you think it is. If you're listening out there, it is not. It is something that can help you. Because just think about what you do with your friends. Your therapist is your friend. And you talk it out. And he or she has the skills to, to, to unpack that stuff that you're telling them so that they can give you the best tools necessary to get through whatever it is you're going through, to understand how it's affecting you so that you can be a better person than you were when you came in the door and sat in in his or her chair. Thank you both for that free advertisement for therapy services. Uh, I do want to assure people that they were not paid to make those responses. <laughs> um, I, can I just tell you that broke my heart to hear this, this little boy say about his dad, I don't have one because he's not. Okay, I just needed to say that. Um, because I, I know that there are just so many different things that people don't even recognize you experience within your families. Uh, but then here's this other piece of, now the military becomes a part of my identity. It becomes a, how, a part of how I see myself. And then at some point, I'm no longer in the military. I transition out. 
for whatever reason. Maybe I'll retire, maybe I decide, okay, this is just my last time serving, or, or unfortunately some people are, are made to, to leave the military. So what happens then when this structure, this system that I've gotten used to functioning, because the military world is very different than the civilian world, Mm-hmm. How do I transition, right? I know a lot of people have medical conditions by the time they leave the military or mental health conditions or divorces, as you all have mentioned, or breakups or children who feel like they've been abandoned uh, by the time they leave the military. So can you all just talk about what you've seen in terms of how people are affected once they have this military identity and then they transition out of the military? Well, the um, the Army has what's called the uh, Soldier for Life Transition Assistance Program. It's, it used to be called the Army Career and Alumni Program, ACAP. And so when soldiers are preparing for their departure, they used to say, I'm going through ACAP. I'm going to ACAP. So they spend the last two months or so going back and forth to if they're in if they're in a non-large military installation they go to those large military installations the fort hood the fort pole the fort uh bennings and and they get career assistance they go through medical and they try and uh determine if there are any medical issues that they have that they can be compensated for through the va things of that nature the unfortunate thing is most, because they're on their way out, they just do it. I mean, I got to go to ACAP. They go to ACAP, they go through the program, and they finish, and they roll out. And it would be my recommendation that they take full advantage of that because they get resume help. Because some of them may be enlisted soldiers who were grunts, who were on the battlefield, shooting guns, kicking down doors doors and and never really went out and got any 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 skills outside of that so when they come off the battlefield and they're soldiers like that that just kicked in doors shot weapons and and drove tanks uh, there are no tanks in civilian society to speak of i mean there are some similar type tanks on some of the police forces but that's a whole nother subject but there are no tanks for them to drive so what do you do? How do you how do you take those skills that you received in the military and you uh, transfer them to civilian society? Well, that's what that program is for. It ain't the best program in the world, but it's something. It's something that's similar to your career services at your school. They're going to help you utilize your skills and transfer them to civilian society so that you can do something that will help you if you're not getting a a a, a full on retirement. Uh, you need a job. You need to be able to pay your bills. You need to be able to pay for that therapy that you're going to need because you kind of got screwed up by kicking in doors and being shot at by people over in Afghanistan. So I would say take full advantage of those programs and and ensure that if there is, and nine times out of 10, there is something that is amiss after your service that you can be compensated for it and that you can utilize the services that are out there with the Veterans Affairs, with other organizations that will, will give you uh, um, opportunities to take advantage of through, through their help programs like Military One Source and things like that so that you can be, you can be as whole as you were when you came in or, or just that much better on your way out. So I think for me, this is, it's an interesting question because my, uh, my years of service still start with a one. Um, so I'm not quite, quite at retirement yet. Again, youngest person in the room here. Um, <laughs> uh, just speaking from what I've seen, like I have had friends who have retired. Um, I've seen, you know, friends who've gotten out. Um, my father retired a few months before I entered. Um, and what I hear a lot is, you know, especially amongst those who got out and didn't retire, you know, I miss the camaraderie in the military. I miss feeling like, you know, I'm a part of a team. Um, I have seen 
uh, many, many people who just refuse to take the uniform off mentally, right? Um, and in, when you're in the military and you live your life very structured every day for 20 years, you know, it is difficult, very difficult to remove yourself from who you are in the military. Um, and even at my, my 17 years, uh, I still find myself, I have to remind myself that this is what I do. It is not who I am. Um, and you just, I, I use as a mantra, kind of prepare because one day, you know, one day I will no longer wear this uniform. Um, and you have to be prepared for that. And just little things that I've, I've started to do, uh, again, being a woman in the military, you, you live in a completely different world, right? And I found that all of my friends were males in the military or women in the military. Um, and there's very few women in the military. So the majority of my friends were males. Um, nothing wrong with that, but I was tired of talking about launching missiles off of the ship. You know, I, I was like, man, I want to talk about the latest nail color that came out. Like, hold on, let me get some, let me get some girlfriends who are not in the military. So I can, it, it's weird, but I had to, I have started to, in a way, um, deprogram myself uh, just because, like I said, one day, I know I will no longer be in the military and I want to be able to transition into civilian life. Um, so I've, I've made a point to expand my circle of friends to come out of my military comfort zone, um, to start having conversations, to talk about, you know, hey, what does a resume look like? I've never really had to fill one out. I came in right out of college. You know, sure, I had little college jobs, but that's not the same as you know, having an adult job and how do I take everything that I have done in the military and accomplished and transfer that into civilian language that is useful. You know, nobody cares that I got a Navy commendation medal. No, what, what does that mean? You know, you have to be able to explain what you did and how you did it and make it make sense. Um, I also remind myself that when I take this uniform off, you know, no one is going to call me ma'am. I am going to be Lori. So I had to figure out who Lori outside of my uniform is, you know, and, and that is not an easy journey, you know, because like I said, you do have that structure and you have, you know, the, the ma'ams and the sirs around you 24 um, seven, but you just have to make it a point. I had to make it a point to, to find things outside of the uniform that I like to do, that I like to talk about. So when, when the youngest person in the room does finally decide that my time is over, I'm, I'm hoping that I will be a little better mentally prepared to, to face the outside world. So it's hard to come behind that, but as you can see, COVID-19, working from home, telework has been really good, made me really think about it. You know, and I'm still thinking about it, so I know I won't be doing this too much longer, but everything uh, that you, Jag, and, uh, and Lori has said are, are spot on. There's not much more I can add there. Uh, I think about this daily. What can I do on the outside? You know, how does my work tran translate to the civilian corps? And, and what, are, what is my skill set worth? What am I really worth out there? And I don't know. And, uh, and, and so those are, those are the struggle points I have. Those are the struggle points that my friends have. You know, they work through all the, the school transitioning uh, programs and the medical and things like that to make sure that they are taken care of properly for the service that they have done. But being who you really are outside of the uniform is a struggle point for many of us. And, uh, you know, I am close. Uh, I'm kind of just balancing my time with Lori so we can go out around the same time. That's the only reason I'm sticking around um, at this point in my mind, you know, but uh, I, I know I have good uh, service to do here in the Navy, so I do it. 
uh, to the best of my abilities. But, you know, what can I do on the outside? That That's the other part. So if I was to go tomorrow, I'd be lost. So I'm still trying to find myself uh, while I still have time in and good service in me uh, to discover who I am for the next life. That's it. Uh, you know, I, I, I can appreciate that, what, what all of our guests are saying on that. As that transition, I, I was, I guess I'm the one who's had the chance to do it uh, and transition out, retire, and uh, I'm in the civilian life helping veterans as you guys come out. Uh, so there's Veterans Defender, there's always room for you there. <laughs> so all of y'all <laughs> to be able to come uh, and help us there as we, we grow the, the brand. Uh, but the, the the real thing that I am really impressed with is that you guys uh, do have good, you got good service to do. You have more work to do to help others. Uh, you're there to be shining examples uh, while racism doesn't work. While you're there to be shining examples while racism costs us as a nation money. Uh, it is expensive to be racist. Uh, and it hurts in the cultivation of this amazing talent that you all have. And that someone could have done something to impact your career on an immutable characteristic like the color of your skin. Uh, and, and we're proud that you guys are, are transformative leaders, that you believe how the power of having someone to help you quarterback your life, uh, a life coach, a mental health therapist, or someone there to help you because sometimes things are outside the scope of yourself and going to get that person to help you quarterback it uh, is great. Even here in this show, uh, this is not a lawyer show. This is a show where I count on a healthcare professional, mental health uh, uh, provider who helps us balance all these things out. Because I'm gung-ho, rah, 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 and she's like, what does it all mean? <laughs> you know, she, helps, she helps me quarterback and unpack these things. Um, this has been, I, I, again, by far my favorite show. I know we've tried to cover so much, uh, and we're so lucky to be able to have you here. Before I wrap up, I want to ask Dr. Tarver to do some closing words before I ask you guys to provide resources, books, or, or uh, uh, something that our, our listeners can take away with. Uh, Dr. Tarver. I just want to thank you all for taking time. You are, you're all family people. You have spouses, uh, two of you here together, balancing children and families. And I think oftentimes there's this perception of people in the military that they're just by themselves and that they don't have these other things that are part of their lives. I, I think it's important you all have shared some, <laughs> hopefully the chest things will still be married after this. <laughs> um, you have shared some important things for people to think about prior to joining the military. Also the importance of paying attention to resources that are available, including when it's time to transition and that everybody's experience may look a little different, but you need to find whatever that is for you, that support of your prayer, your family, your therapy, um, other people in the military or even outside of the military to be able to help you get through. And I wanna thank you all for sharing that because someone needs to hear that. And because of you, they may just move a little different than they would have otherwise. So thanks again. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Tarver, uh, thank you, uh, Chestings, as a, as a retiree and a vested member of that, that time on the traditions of the, the military, uh, the branches of service, uh, we thank you for your service. We thank you for your family service. We recognize you're the tip of the iceberg that we see in the uniform. We know that there is a, there are scores and scores of people that make you great. We know uh, Miss Lawrence makes you great, Judge Lawrence. <laughs> we know that uh, uh, you, you two make each other great and all your family members that, that, that back you up. Uh, I've got to get Scott that, that little remote control, that little car so we can, we can bring her out to fight with you guys. Uh, but, but I want to ask you guys in closing, if you don't mind, please provide our listeners with some great books or recommendations or websites that you guys like to use uh, to help you or help you with your, your careers, leadership books uh, as African-American leaders. Uh, that may inspire you, irrespective of who makes the book. But give us some some le great leadership opportunities, uh, uh, Commissioner Lawrence. What would be a, a good recommendation you would have for our listeners? That that's kind of a loaded question. I've been pondering that when you said that in the beginning of the show. I've, I've been, I mean, I'm in the army, and um, I kind of took to the whole uh, understanding of 
of, of our great leaders in the past. So I've, I've read uh, American Caesar, which uh, about MacArthur. Um, um, but I've also read about the issues that affect us as African Americans. Um, uh, Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be Anti-Racist. Um, White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. Um, just to name a few. I also read the three volume foot by Shelby, three volume edition of uh, the narrative of the Civil War by Shelby Foote. It was a long read, but it was extremely good. So I'm, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, those are great. Those are great resources, and we appreciate you bringing them uh, to our guests. Um, um, and the chest stains, uh, could you guys uh, please provide us some resources? And make sure you mention uh, the singing group, please. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll leave the singing part up to Randy. Um, so I, I, I made a list. Um, I have uh, what I like to call the African American History Library. So if anybody needs some resources, feel free to look me up. I can send them to you. Um, but I made a short list. Uh, I will say that the first book on my list is a shameless plug because I am in it. Um, I actually found this book a couple years ago. Uh, I was an ensign on board USS Benfold during the tsunami that hit Indonesia. Um, Life-changing experience. But uh, Robert Kaplan came out and I did not realize at the time that he was writing a book. Um, me being young and naive, I thought he was a journalist there writing a news article. Little did I know, um, he wrote a book and he chose to write a little bit of my experience into that book. Um, so I like to say, uh, no matter what happens to me in this career, uh, I'm in a military history book, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. So uh, the first book is Hog Pilots, Blue Water Grunts, The American Military in the Air at Sea and the Ground. Um, again, that's by Robert Kaplan. Another book that I love uh, being a, a woman in the military is She Captains, Heroines and Hellions of the Sea by Joan Druitt. Um, it gives a, a history of women in naval service uh, all the way back to ancient Egypt. So um, sometimes we get overlooked, but uh, Ms. Druitt took the time to, to write about us. Um, absolutely, for naval history, the Golden 13, recollections of the first black naval officers. Um, I'm also a bit of a history buff, so I love Life Upon These Shores, Henry Louis Gates, uh, Lest We Forget the Passage from Africa to Slavery and Emancipation by Velma Thomas. Um, it's, uh, I call it my I hope I don't offend anyone. It's my pop-up book on slavery. Um, but I like it because it is, it's written very well. It's interactive. There's actually um, reproductions of documents, slave documentation um, that you can, it's good for children as well. You can turn the page and pull out, you know, the, the price list of a slave or turn the page and open, open the doors of a slave ship and see inside of it. Um, so it's something interactive, and I think it's a good way to start to address the issue of slavery with children. Um, some movies that I would recommend um, are, uh, of course, 13, Ava DuVernay, um, along those lines, When They See Us. Uh, and I also, I love Hidden Figures. Um, and that, that movie moved me to the point of tears uh, because for the first time, I saw someone who understood how it felt to be the smartest person in the room, yet be ignored because you're Black and a woman. Um, and I think if, if anyone is, is wondering what it is like to live in, in that world, Hidden Figures is a great book. Or, well, it, it is a book. I have a copy of it. And a great movie to watch. Um, some resources that are out there, uh, like the commissioner mentioned, militaryonesource.mil, that's awesome. Um, you know, if you are looking for that mental health professional, if you are looking for family resources, um, if you are, are looking for help doing your military move, you know, you should go to Military One Source. Um, National Naval Officers 
Association, NNOA.org. Um, I'd be remiss to not mention them. Founded, I, I believe it was in 1972, um, with the purpose to, to help guide and mentor the careers of uh, sea servicemen um, who do not look like the majority. Um, and also, uh, part of my job now is to be involved in um, the, the audit. I work with the audit team, uh, not to determine what gets audited, I'm, I'm on a different side of it, but um, anyone who's interested in reading more uh, information on, on some of the reports that are out there, um, what Congress is interested in when it comes to the military and other things, uh, you can absolutely find those reports from the government audit uh, office at gao.gov and also from the DOD um, and, and Inspector General, so dodig.mil, um, and you can find more reports similar to the one that we discussed this evening. So I think Randy's got you know, something there. And so I just add one book to that and then a couple uh, Facebook groups that, uh, you know, if you're into social media that you could join, at least from, uh, uh, the military side, and then uh, if you're Navy, one specific Navy group. But uh, the one book I want to add is The Flight of Jesse L. Brown uh, by Jesse L. Brown. Uh, it talks about uh, his challenges uh, being a pilot uh, back in the uh, back in the day. And uh, you know, I don't think many of those uh, those challenges have really gone away as we talked about racial discrimination and such uh, tonight. Uh, a lot of those things that he uh, he experienced in, um, we probably still face to some degree today. So it's just it's good to take a look at that and and kind of compare that to what you're facing now. Um, as for uh, resources, I uh, talked about uh, adding a Facebook group if you're uh, you know military any any service. Uh, the Afri African American Military Officers Group. Uh, it's on Facebook. Uh, you have a lot of people from uh, generals and admirals all the way down. And uh, you can just throw a question out there uh, to get you some help and help you understand how to deal with a situation. If you want to just vet uh, something or, uh, or vent even uh, and express yourself, there are people that are willing to, uh, to chime in on what your thoughts are and kind of guide, help guide you uh, in you know, down the right path and get you some help when you, uh, you didn't think uh, you knew what to do. Uh, for, uh, for Navy, uh, there's also another group uh, that I use as a resource called the Conglomerate, and uh, it's uh, enlisted and officer. And uh, we're, we're out there, we're just talking. Uh, everything that we're talking about right now, we're talking about the same thing on, on the page. And, uh, and people are just trying to figure out how to, to manage and cope through these situations. So it's always good to have different perspectives from the, uh, the enlisted, the senior enlisted, and the officer uh, to, to kind of keep people going in the right direction so they don't go out there and make any mistakes. And, uh, and that's all we really want to do. We want to go out and do our best. Uh, we want some help when we need it, you know, <laughs> and then we want to help somebody else so that they can be great. And so that's what this is all about. And, uh, and I appreciate uh, being able to be a part of this because that's what I ultimately want to do is help someone. So thank you. No, thank you all. Uh, Judge, I mean, Judge Lawrence, can you give us your, your website for, for your uh, judicial campaign? Well, we have, uh, you, you did say I am running, but I have not announced to the extent that I have uh, left my job and went full on, but what I will do is I will get it to you and you can put it out to the people once we have it up. But um, we do have a Facebook page that uh, is Quintilis for Judge. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yes. Because you're one of my heroes, one of my mentors, and I have to do everything in my little power, little power. What, what's crazy is that you call me your hero, but I remember when we were in law school, you deployed while in law school. <laughs> and again, I was like, man, I. I hope that ain't me because I'm trying to finish this before <laughs> anything pop off. And I feel I feel sorry for you, but, <laughs> but you came back, you got it done, and you did what you had to do. So you are a hero. All right. Well, well. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Tarver and I, you know, we we thank you all for coming to the show. You know, as it relates to discussing uh, racial discrimination in the military, 
and you'll see them. Jay, I would all offer to our listeners, please, 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 uh, number one, uh, go and talk to your Congress people and have them to challenge the Department of Defense to get this done and fix it now. Number two, Military One Source, if you're still in the military, Military One Source is there year, uh, up to a year when you get out, you still get access to that. And hopefully you'll get some VA, VA benefits to be able to continue that or you get to retire uh, to get those, those help. Getting access to mental health care is not a, should not be a stigma. It's somebody to help you quarterback. I run a company and I need help, you know, someone to help me quarterback that with all of the things that unpack uh, that you go through. So it's, it, you're becoming stronger and better for it. So to our listeners, we thank you so much for listening. This is, uh, we have been discussing racial discrimination uh, in the military and UCMJ. This is In Our Own Defense podcast. This concludes this episode of In Our Own Defense. We're your host, Attorney A.D. Winters and Dr. Dolores Tarver. For more information about our podcast, please follow us on social media, on YouTube at In Our Own Defense, on Instagram at In Our Own Defense, Facebook, In Our Own Defense, and Gmail at In Our Own Defense at gmail.com. Thank you and have a great day.